Uh, and I'm so glad to see everyone out tonight to celebrate Mary Swan and to celebrate her new book, My Ghosts. And uh, I think we're going to get Mary up to read for all y'all. Mary. The trip had all been John's idea. He came home with a clutch of brightly colored brochures, fanned them out like a card trick, and said, let's go to Greece, let's just go. She knew it was bravado, the bounce in his voice, knew that she could puncture it with a word, but where would that leave them? So she began making lists, check passports, try on bathing suit, buy new sunglasses. She arranged for her mother to stay with Lizzie, who said she'd die if she had to eat those casseroles for 10 days. <laughs> you probably won't, Claire said, but she bought a stack of pizzas for the freezer, a big jar of popcorn for all the late movies she knew they'd watch, school night or not. She felt the familiar, childish niggle when she thought of how flexible her mother's rules were when it came to Lizzie. How she'd always praised every cartwheel and report card, clapped loudly at school concerts and plays. But there was so much to organize that there wasn't much space for other thoughts, and then the taxi doors slammed and the familiar streets fell away so quickly behind them. The airport itself was a dislocating swirl of color and movement and echoing sound. Everyone in a hurry, it seemed, tapping heels in a bombardment of scents, power suits, and gelled hair. In the middle of it all, there was a young man, a boy, standing with his back firm to a round pillar. Not dressed for the weather, maybe that's what caught her eye, buffalo sandals and frayed jeans, a tie-dyed t-shirt and long, straggling hair. He's on a bad trip in 1969, she thought, and once she would have said it to John, but she didn't. As they settled into their seats and buckled their belts, she thought about that boy and wondered if he was still there. Thought about his absolute stillness and his stunned eyes and how he'd seemed like someone who'd been flung through time, suddenly awake in a world where no one could possibly know him. On the second day, she reached for a bitter dark olive through the dappled light and felt something surrender. Felt it as a loosening in her shoulders down her spine as sudden as an unexpected blow. John swam in the early morning, hiked in the dusty hills, and sometimes Claire went with him, but more often she tucked a beach mat under her arm along with a fat paper bag she rarely opened. Alone with my thoughts, she said, although she knew that wasn't the right word for the lazy meanderings in her head. Day after day, balanced on the edge of sleep on a mat on the hot sand, Sometimes the oily putt of a boat's motor, then only the water rippling onto the shore. By early afternoon, the beach was more crowded, chattering families and young men batting balls back and forth, children shrieking in the water. Then she rolled up her mat, shook sand from the splayed book, and began the walk to the blue shuttered room. She kicked a ball back to a curly-haired boy and thought of Lizzie running, her ponytail switching and the fierce, rapt look on her face, and how that was the point, the whole point of the piles of laundry, the rushed meals, and the shouting from the bottom of the stairs. They were always on the verge of being late, always missing something, even when Claire ran through the checklist. Have you got your uniform, shin pads, shoes? Have you got a headband? Once it was water they'd forgotten, and she bought a bottle at the kiosk, carried it over to the player's side of the field. The air was golden and completely still, the kind of evening when any sound carries a long way. But all Claire heard was the rasp of the short brown grass on the soles of her sandals. She stopped, her hand cold on the bottle, and looked at the girls, all 13, 14 years old, in their red shirts, red shorts, with their hair tied back, their bruised knees. They were completely silent as they took out earrings or put tape over studs, as they unclipped watches and bracelets, reached behind their necks or turned their backs for another to undo a clasp, silver chains rippling as they passed from hand to hand. A ritual she'd never noticed from her lawn chair at the far side of the field, and she was pierced by the way they moved through it, by their concentration and their beauty. One girl turned, and it was Lizzie. Claire tossed the plastic bottle, and it seemed to glow as it flipped through the air and landed lightly in her daughter's hands.